In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to install high-performing SQL servers. Coming up. First, we'll head on over to the SQL Server Downloads page to download SQL. I recommend downloading the Developer Edition. This gives you access to all of the features of SQL Server so you can practice. So from here you click Download. It's a small executable file. You can click Save, then run the file. And now this, this gives you the options of doing a basic install, a custom install, or you can download the media. So what I do is I download the media. They give you an ISO file you can mount, and then it's just like having the SQL Server disk to install. So you'll have all the files local. So you can install it on different machines if you choose. Now I already downloaded it. But once you download it, you'll have an ISO file like this. Simply right click, choose mount. Once you do that, It'll mount it as another drive and bring up the media. From here, you can double click Setup to run the installer. Now for this video, we're installing SQL Server 2019. Opening the installer will bring you to the SQL Server Installation Center. Now this first screen is the planning page. It just gives you links to all sorts of documentation. What we're really interested in is installation, so click Installation on the left. That'll bring you to the installation page. Now, for this video, we're going to install a new installation of SQL Server, right? But from here, you can also install management tools because you're definitely going to need some way to interact with and run queries and build databases against the SQL Server. So you're going to need some sort of client tools, okay? SQL Server data tools, this is for installing things like um, integration services, analysis services. This allows you to build ETL workflows, things of that sort. It integrates with Visual Studio for data integration, right? But also reporting services to build reports, things of that, that nature, okay? But what we're mainly concerned about for, for this video um, is a standalone installation, okay? And here also you can install obviously reporting services like I just mentioned, okay? So we're going to click that. All right, so the first screen here, you can do updates if you choose. For this video, we don't need to do that, um, although it is recommended. All right. We're going to click Next, and it'll start installing the setup files. This will give you various warnings if, if needed. So for here, we got a warning about Windows Firewall. Okay, so what this is saying is it's going to warn us about ports. So in order to connect the SQL Server from different machines, obviously certain ports need to be open. Now, the default port is 1433, but that can be changed based on how you configure your SQL Server. So it's warning you that you have a firewall, you may need to open the ports. In this case, we're fine. We're going to click Next. Now, this is where you want to leave this first option. We're installing a new installation of SQL Server. That's what this is about. That's what we're going to do. No change here. Click Next. Now, this is where you want to specify what edition are you installing or, or enter a product key if you have one. Right? We can install Express Edition, Evaluation. We want Developer Edition. We want to take advantage of all the features of SQL Server. All right, accept the license. All right, now here's where we're going to select the features we want to install. I'll go over some of these in more detail. All right, obviously we want the database engine. That is the main SQL Server engine. Definitely need that. SQL Server replication. This is for exactly that, replication services. So let's say you wanted to mirror the data to another SQL Server, right? So, so copy data seamlessly from one SQL Server to another. You might do this for failover. You might do this for disaster recovery, right? So if one SQL Server goes down, you have a mirror image of another SQL Server that you can fail over to in case something happens to your primary SQL Server, okay? There are various strategies and approaches and technologies for doing this. That's, that's what this is, okay? Machine learning services. Now, I do a lot with machine learning. I haven't played around with this yet, uh, but apparently you can integrate with Python uh, and use T-SQL commands within Python for machine learning. So now full text and semantic extractions. You may have seen this and wondered, what is this? Well, I'll explain a little bit about what it is. Let's suppose you store documents in SQL Server. SQL Server does have the ability to do that. Um, 
you can use these features are extensions of search features where you can actually search within the document. So you can search for text like keywords, but you can also search for the meaning of documents. So you can extend that a little bit further. So instead of just keywords, you can search on the meaning of a document. Okay. Polybase query service. Now this allows you to use T-SQL against other external data sources like Oracle or Teradata. Okay. That's what this feature is. Analysis services. This is for uh, more advanced reporting and analytics. Okay, you decide if you need these or not. Uh, client connectivity. I always select that. Integration services, again, for ETLs, data integration. Okay. Integration services is a great product, by the way. All right, so that, those are some of those features, just in case you're wondering. Now, um, this directory here, this folder down here, instance root directory, this is just where do you want to install SQL Server. So most of the time, you're going to want to install it on your OS drive, the same drive as your OS. In this case, mine is the C drive. Most of the time, it's the C drive. Um, that's all that is. So we can leave this and click Next. Let me explain a little bit here. This is the instance configuration. A default instance will take on the name of the actual machine it is installed on. So if the name of your server that you're installing SQL Server on is named Server01, then the name of your SQL Server will also be Server01. And when, when you want to connect to SQL Server using client tools, you will just connect to Server01, and that will connect to this instance of SQL Server. However, sometimes a server can have multiple SQL Servers installed on them. In that case, only one SQL Server can have that default instance, but you can, if you install another instance, it must be a named instance. So only one instance can be the default instance and take on the name of the server. If you install additional instances, they must be named. So let's say you had a development server and you want to install a development and a QA SQL server on them. So maybe the development instance will be the default instance and in this case we're going to install a QA instance. So we're just going to give it a name, we'll call it QA. Now when you connect to it, let's suppose the server name is server01. You're going to connect to server01 slash QA and that will point to this SQL Server on that machine, okay? So we're gonna click Next here. Now the accounts. You may have specific service accounts that you wanna to use to run these different services. I'm gonna leave the defaults, but one thing I also like to do is the SQL Server agent. You see how that startup type is manual? SQL Server agent is used to run jobs. So if you plan on creating, building, running jobs, scheduling jobs, SQL Server jobs, I would change this to automatic. SQL Server agent, I think, is an important part of SQL Server. Uh, I like to keep that running. Collation, this is where you're gonna choose, um, for example, if you want the database to be case sensitive or not, okay? Language, things of that sort. I'll leave the default and click Next. Authentication. Do you want to just use domain accounts? If so, then you'll choose Windows Authentication. If you want to be able to use domain accounts and create SQL Server accounts, so these are accounts that just live within SQL Server, you would choose Mix Mode. Here is where you will also give the System Administrator password or the SA account. So I'll set that. Now, if you are installing this from a server using the system administrator account, you may want to also click add current user. You may have a domain account that acts as the administrator account, right? Every organization has that. So you may potentially want that account to be able to administer the SQL Server as well. So you can add that here. Now let's move on to data directories. Now data directories, this is an important step. This is where you want to choose what drives SQL Server will store its data files. Now, part of installing a high-performing SQL Server is making sure all of the data files are on separate disks, okay? So, our data root directory. This is just a base directory. So, we'll give it, we're gonna make sure this is on a separate drive, okay? So, I'm gonna store it on my D drive or my data drive and the data folder, okay? Now you can see here, it'll show you where it'll put all of the system databases that's based off of that root directory. So that's our data directory, all right? Now the user database, we'll keep it in the same folder. This video, I'm installing this on my local PC. Now the log, 
This especially needs to be on a separate disk, okay? So I'll put this on my E log folder. And the backup, we'll put this on the F backup folder. All right, so now you've got your user databases on your D drive, your log on my E drive, and I'm writing backups to my F drive. Okay, so now they're all on separate drives. Now let's configure tempdb, another important step. The tempdb database is one of the most important SQL Server system databases. This is used to store temporary user objects, like temporary tables defined by the user, but it's also used to store internal objects that are created by the SQL Server database engine during different operations, like creating intermediate sorting tables. Now, tempdb can sometimes grow unexpectedly, so make sure you configure it with a reasonable initial size and auto growth amounts to avoid frequent small increment amounts that affect overall performance. In other words, you don't want tempdb to have to keep growing itself incrementally because it needs more space, right? So give it a nice amount of size to start off with and do exactly the same thing we did with the other data directories. It is very important that tempdb is on a separate disk drive away from the other user and system databases. This will keep tempdb from affecting the performance of the other databases. Now, if you really want to step things up, you can set the number of files based on the number of logical processors you have on the machine and then you set the corresponding data directories to match that number. So if you had, let's just say, eight logical processors on the machine, you could set that to eight files and have eight data directories as well. And eight is the maximum number of files you can have. And this will enhance your overall SQL Server performance. Now I'm gonna leave these settings as is, just because I'm on my local PC. Next up, maximum degree of parallelism. Now, this should just match the number of logical cores you have on your CPU. This maximizes the parallelism of the machine. But if you have multiple instances, maybe you want to change this. Basically, you're just telling SQL Server the maximum number of cores it's allowed to use. Memory. This is another important step. Now, SQL Server will consume all of the memory on the machine if you allow it. You don't want to do that. Now you also have to take in consideration if there are multiple instances on this machine. Now there are some guidelines for this. One of which is you immediately take four gigabytes and allocate that to the operating system. Okay? Then for every eight gigabytes of RAM you have, you allocate another gigabyte to the operating system. Okay? Obviously what I'm saying is this is very dependent on the amount of RAM you have on the machine. So I have 64 gigabytes of RAM on my machine. So I'm going to take away 4 gigabytes immediately for the OS. That leaves 60 gigabytes remaining. Divide that by 8, you get about 7.5. So let's just call it add another 7 gigabytes for the OS. That's a total of 11. That leaves 53 gigabytes remaining for SQL Server, which is plenty. So we'll leave some room and set it to 49. So we'll change this to 49,000 because it's in megabytes. Okay? And then we'll click Next. And that's that. Review all your settings before clicking install, and away you go. Thanks so much for watching, but please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell.